Welcome to the Microbial Secret Society Podcast, where we dive deep into the esoteric realms of the soil and demystify Okay, and we're live. Welcome to episode number five of the Microbial Secret Society podcast. Yeah, so uh, we, we've been doing a fair amount of things, but I've uh, been trying to get this podcast up and launched these past week, and uh, yeah. Yeah, you've been trying to uh, yeah put it out there. I've seen you put it on like different outlets like Stitcher and... Maybe Google Play. I'm not sure. Yeah, I just kind of went down the list. I looked at all the different podcast things that were out there, and I just tried to just smorgasbord put them <laughs> put them out there. The the idea being that I I put the first hour everywhere mm-hmm. and try to get as much exposure as we can to folks to listen to this and share it with people, and then when they're ready, then they'll be ready to get the second hour. And the second hour is not, it's not, it's not on all those services. It's, it's just on microbialsecret.org. Okay. So it's just on those services. Yeah. So somehow there's a way to integrate it within Apple, I think, but I'm not. Well, there, there is a way, but it's hard, to, hard to get it. So it's, it's free. So you get the first hour free and then the second hour premium where it's like just members and there's, it's, it's man, it like, I should start a service just building podcast framework for people. Yeah. Because it's one thing to sit here and talk about this stuff. Yeah, it's another thing to actually be able to do it and create it. And, and that's and that's what like with with the secret society and a lot of things we see just parts of it and we think, oh, well, that's it, and that's easy to do. But the hidden work that goes on behind the scenes on almost everything is just that's that's where the magic really happens. And yeah, what's happening behind the scenes that other people don't necessarily see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whether your podcast is good or not depends on, you know, getting distribution to your customer and, you know, whether your microbes are good or not, good or not depends on those, those same type of factors. Yeah. Different factors that determine the quality of whatever endeavor you pursue and, and or microbially with natural farming and human health. Yeah. And d- different endeavors in the soil and everything. Yeah. Um, Different soil endeavors. So, uh, what do you what do you want to go into in this episode? What do I want to go into? Um, I'm I'm open. I'm open for for whatever. I, I have been just doing watching a lot of videos on Aircrete. Aircrete. Yeah. As like a for for what reason? Uh. The, curious on like how it works and like what yeah how how the techniques could be applied and then to build i think it's like a affordable way that seems like like it's pretty simple so my my understanding of air creek because i'm just is basically you make like concrete but you pump air into it to make tiny ass air bubbles and then then you put also like the other part of concrete that makes it good is that it has like rebar in it Mm -hmm. so what i know about the aircrete is usually they use like hemp fiber or something as like uh to to be the steel inside the concrete Mm, yeah so the so i watched a video it was like do it yourself create like a a foamer like an air foamer with soap for thirty dollars basically just had some pvc and an air compressor and had a chamber for soap and then the 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 water and the soap like goes in and then it shoots out as like a foaming agent and basically all all you need to do is um mix your concrete mix and then you add your foaming agent to it and it turns into this like you put it in molds and then you let it dry and it turns into these blocks and the blocks are like lightweight they float in water they're fire resistant so if you put a flame on one side of it you wouldn't be able to feel the heat it'd be cool on the other side no oh, yeah because of the air it's like thermal insulation mm-hmm. and 
and and then that's basically it. And then to build the domes, they just like they have like a center piece. And there's like these different frames that come off the center. It's almost like a star and they just keep a level. They, they, the, it's like a guide to show like where to put the blocks and at what angle. And you just like keep moving them up and up and up. And then they also put like weight, like water weight, like water bottles filled with water and a string tied to the top to like, cause when you start building up, you need like, the, the reinforcing weight going back down to make sure it like stays secure so they just keep adding like every level layer they go up they then will just move their sandbag or their water bottle weight bag up a level and then eventually they'll come to a fold and then they're able to just like yeah you can just cast anything and then with the mold and then put it and then shape it to the building and you can literally just like cut through it with a skill saw it's so it's so like malleable and yeah and then and then typically what people will do is they'll put that like a some sort of fiber or something on the on the outside like a hemp or a canaf or like some commercial like fiber and then they'll pl- they'll do like a like a plaster on um, like a cement plaster on the outside or almost like a fiberglass finish so the water won't even be able to like stay on it or anything it'll just r- drip right off but it seems like it's really like it's mostly labor and it's like unskilled labor can do it is what i've like from my research and it, this is just like a few YouTube videos. <laughs> so basically you're, you're building air, these blocks that have air crete and then you're stacking them in a certain configuration and then you're plastering it. And like that, that's, it's like a home. I mean, it, it could be, I mean, I've seen different designs of like where they have like multiple ones, like kind of side by side by side with like interlocking rooms or arch doorways where, you know, maybe one is like a little kitchen or one is a study, one's a bedroom. And they're kind of like almost like hobbit domes, hobbit <laughs> hobbit houses or something like that. But you could, I mean, the video online was for like, for a family was going to live in it, but someone recommended that it could be utilized for agricultural purposes too i mean it's 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 like hurricane proof the thing like the design of the the structure is actually what reinforces its strength more so than like how typical concrete will work with like the rebar and stuff so because it's based more on like more of a sacred geometry round sphere design it's actually more stable than like a square Mm -hmm. nice easy to build easy to measure uh traditional well not true well like modern modern western kind of construction warehouses yeah um and then i i couldn't the one video was uh it was on Kauai, and the i couldn't they didn't say how big the building was maybe it was like it kind of looked maybe like 800 square feet or so. It was hard to tell, like the shape of the dome. But they said that, that that's about like $10,000 worth of materials plus your labor, which I feel like is cheaper than wood. And wood is like, the price of wood is rising. It's like, you know, there were, yeah. Well, the, the other thing, the other thing is that supposedly the concrete doesn't like degrade, right? It's like you build it once and it potentially would last like hundreds of years yeah but i think the oldest one is only like just less than five years old oh so it's a modern kind of like innovation that they've they've it's a modern innovation that hasn't necessarily had the time to be able to observe how long they will last i know i know khalil gibran's grandson is doing this like khalil gibran wrote the prophet which is kind of an interesting book Uh uh-huh and then his grandson is like uh one of the people promoting these the the hempcrete domes and he's been i don't know if he's the one on Kauai, but he's been teaching he taught a class on this island in javi really actually while we were in korea this this past year uh maybe two years ago they taught a class and then i or yeah maybe yeah anyway maybe i think maybe it was when i went to korea this last year i don't think you went on that trip mm-hmm. 
but yeah so so i know the technology is coming to the island and people learned my friend bobby grimes who's an interesting character if you look him up on the internet he's he's all into biodynamics and interesting character good good friend of mine and he i just love his his youthful energy but he's he's into like the biodynamics and these sacred geometry type of concepts and he took the class and he he got super pumped on it because he thought of it as a way to like solve our housing problem here Mm -hmm. but i know after the class he was like it's a lot more work than you think yeah a lot of prep goes into it and it's a lot of energy and effort and planning probably and well he was he was just surprised because they took a, a course where there was like a dozen or so people there and their their thing was to build this uh hempcrete dome Mm -hmm. over like a weekend and like or maybe it's like five days or something and like by day three like they had you know a few bricks together and they like started to measure out from the center to get the radius to build their little dome but they were he was surprised like how much work it was to make just like a few bricks and things Mm -hmm. and then then, like he, he said majority of what's strengthens it is the shell on the outside it's that plaster that you put on there Mm -hmm. that's really what makes because the hempcrete bricks are kind of like give it structure but they would they would shatter if you didn't put the plaster on or Mm -hmm. they they just wouldn't add that strength to it so yeah it needs that like outside coating for more strength yeah but that's what i've seen i think it's i think it's a cool technology the one thing i think like I, I like this house because it's it's nice big windows. Mm-hmm. And I think that as you start to get more round, then the windows, like Hobbit round windows, are always hard to make watertight. Mm. And I think, but so, but I, I could see it as like a, like a place you want to go in inclement weather and like a place you want to go at night and like hunker down and like your, your thing, like, but on a beautiful day, I think... Uh, You'd probably want to be outside. <laughs> yeah. Although I could, because it just, I don't see that much light coming into it, but I imagine it would also insulate well. Yeah, it does insulate really well. And in the tropics, it will be like kind of cool. And if it was built in a place where it was like uh, cold outside, it would it would help retain the heat that's inside. So, um, and I've seen them with like kind of skylights. They'll put like a skylight dome on the top of it to help light kind of come through and that's yeah. cool. I wonder what the interaction would be between the microorganisms and the hemp crete. Well I I utilize like the hemp herd right now and I guess what I was calling hemp crete. You're talking air crete is what you're saying. Air crete, yeah. But hemp crete would just be like using hemp crete with just hemp as the air crete with hemp the, as the, the plat or the the, the fibers in there yeah the fiber that gets then coated over um but i utilize the hemp herd right now in sprouting trays for turmeric and and the hemp herd's like really tough but after the hemp herd gets sprayed with the IMOs, it, it, it becomes like you can see the white mycelium all the way through it. And it just like tears apart really easily. And it holds it helps hold the water and the, the turmeric that are sprouted in there seems to be doing pretty fine. Um, I only yeah, I try not to water them like more than once, just like once a day. Yeah, I guess I ended up talking about hemp herd. But I was, I was talking about what I what I wanted to see, think about was the the air crete uh-huh. and microbes air crete and microbes like so so for instance like i know the microbes eat rocks and like will undermine your foundation so i wonder if the like or my house it's it's moldy because of the imos trying to eat it really well yeah it's it's yeah it's just like my house grows like a biofilm on it from the the <laughs> microbes i get this stuff like other houses just don't get this because they're you know they're more sterile Uh but i'm wondering like if you're living like like for instance if you did an imo pile inside of your your air crete dome would it start to eat the air crete i feel like it would if it eats concrete i i mean the they they do like that plaster level from what i saw is they put that plaster on the bottom because you need like a typically they'll do like a 
a concrete slab or a hemp or an aircrete slab on the ground, and then they put that fiber layer down, and then they put the start laying the bricks, so, and then they seal it, so there's no, so it has like a, so it's really water resistant, and it has that strong seal. I, I feel like the microbes could, are probably strong enough to eat through it. I mean, especially if it's so lightweight and it floats in water. Um, but I, I'd like to see the domes as like microbial temples of like I, making IMOs. But I don't know how long they would last if the microbes would just eat them. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And then how do you design it with like, I guess if you put a skylight or a, like a like a glass ceiling, like how do you get that right exposure to the sun with the 70%? indirect you know 30 percent i think the mic just start eating it man you get what you get <laughs> yeah they'll just start eating it if they like it if it's tasty enough they'll eat it cool air cream man well i just i just finished teaching another class at hawaiian sanctuary you just finished teaching another class how did how did it go I was asking Mandy about it because I was trying to see like what what she thought, and she said it was it was pretty funny. I, I'm trying because I'm teaching the same class that I've taught before, uh -huh. and so it's it's interesting. I I there's there's some students that have taken it previously too, and are taking it again, and I think um, I think it's helping some people. Uh, I gave them a homework assignment tonight. Homework. Yeah, you know, like you know, like Fight Club, how they give out homework assignments. Yeah, what, what did you do? Like, say, um, make FPJ, <laughs> make make a fermented plant juice or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it was it was that <laughs> it was that benign. It was. I started them off nice and easy. Nice was, and easy. Yeah, well, yeah. Because the only reason I know that is because Mandy said that <laughs> she was ex after the class. I talked to her, and she said that she was excited to like make a make a fermented plant juice and then was curious about what i would recommend and i, I didn't really tell her my recommendation but it's i would recommend peyote um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah i don't know you could ferment really anything is there is there any sort of incentive are you going to do like a taste contest between the people that bring it in or no no i mean the they're like that would be cool to like i think we should send them around and taste them and see the difference and compare and contrast yeah but my my incentive was kind of just like you know i'm here teaching do it do it while i'm here instead of having to try to learn from this and then later like a, a couple of weeks from now trying to attempt to do this mm -hmm. because these recipes are so um <laughs> i i made it i tried to make it as simple as i could today i was like look there's like four four things here. Plant material, sugar, fermentation, juice. Four things. It just yeah, the the, the process. You start with plant material. Uh-huh. You add sugar to it. You let it sit in the bucket. And then you end up with this juice. And I was I was like, this process is really easy, you know. It, but but then but then from that, you can start to get into intricacies. Mm -hmm. Like which sugar do I use? Or which plant material do I use? Or, or what time do I gather my plant material? Yeah. Or what size do I make? Or what do I... Yeah. And so all these intricacies that come into this, but like, I was like, look, basically today it's real simple. You're just doing this. And then the rest of the day, like if you understand the concept, the rest of the day, we're just going to spend like talking about intricacies. Like, oh, you know, should I mix limes and lemons? It's like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, it, 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 if does that follow the general basic principle of the material, sugar, f fermentation, buck, you know, and juice comes out? And, like, because I, I could sit there and answer all these questions all day of, like, experiential knowledge and things people want to know. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like what happens is the more of those questions that get answered, the more stuff that gets full in your mind before you just get to do those basic four things. And it can be helpful to know more before you begin, or it can also be like, just go for it. Yeah. What does that go back to? Makahana kaike? 
Makahana Kaike. In working or doing, one learns or knowledge is gained by doing. Keiki learn healthy habits when they practice them. Yeah. And, and there's, all, there's all kinds of levels of like knowing on this, like science and like terms mm-hmm. and like things to like aggregate. F- yeah. Fill your brain with all these words. <laughs> but, but they only mean something if we can convey, you know, like if you speak the same language and we can convey these things, then, then all that stuff I talk about is useful. Mm-hmm. You know, talk, talking about like osmotic pressure and like these scientific things concepts that to me to me it makes it much more like visceral like meaning meaning there's there's more like body to it more more like more more like palpable like i don't know has like a more of a quality to it or a taste or an essence or well let's let's if i take that and i I bring it to like a car like i could just put gas in the car and push the pedals and i know how to do it but I also like knowing about the carburetor and the headers and the mm. exhaust and the air filters and all, all these other systems that are there that I don't need to know that to drive the car. But then you bring that back to the plant juice. And I like to know like osmotic pressures drawing this out or microbes are fermenting this way and these these things are growing like... I like to know about the nitty gritty of like how the machine, but in this case it's life, is is operating. And just I think that's just my my personality. I think some some people just they, like they don't they don't care as much. Hmm. They they would just rather just be able to like get it from a store, maybe. No, but no, like. Like some some people are just okay with like knowing they should use brown sugar, and then they always use the same brand, and they always kind of go through it. And then so, like what I'm saying, what I like to know is I want to know like the actual like root mechanisms. Like why why am I using brown sugar? Uh huh. Because because I I like to optimize the things. So why 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 would one use brown sugar? <laughs> why why use brown sugar? Yeah. Well, through all my study, it it's the has the most minerals, and it has the other properties we're looking for, for a lot of things in natural farming. And th- and there's a difference between, like, raw, granulated cane sugar that like is like slight like slightly brown compared to like light brown sugar or brown sugar that you would you would get is that is the difference just the molasses that's like the the amount of molasses that's in it like i guess why yeah yeah Yeah. i mean that that, in that and that's what i'm saying like the nitty gritties like Mm -hmm. getting into it that's the kind of stuff i like to know and and then there's people in my class too that want to ask specific questions like that Mm -hmm. like those like knowing, oh, is there more, you know, something in this sugar versus that? And then it's like, that's what life's about too, is exploring. I mean, we could just Google it all, or you could just ask me while I'm teaching, or we could just do these things, or we could try and, and learn and, and figure it out. Yeah. By doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, I think that's, what's nice is to, to learn with the, like when I go to share my experience is I try to give people like a basic framework and then if they want to know more, I'll tell them more and teach them more. Cause I, cause I, that's what my experience is, is led me down to these, my mind's like full of this stuff. But I would say it's, I'm not trying to like memorize a bunch of things. Mm-hmm. It's more like becomes like integrated into your knowing because you've done the thing so many times and you've shared it so many times that it's just like, yeah. I mean, the best way to learn something is to like teach it, you know? So if you're able to like share that with others then you're going to be able to integrate and have a deeper understanding on whatever it is that you're teaching. Yeah. And when you, and when you love it, like the mechanisms for explaining it become easier. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like how well 
how well someone knows something it's like the most intricate or complicated or advanced topic like for someone that knows it really well would be able to describe it in simple terms that everyone can like kind of comprehend and grasp yeah and then there's always going to be like intricacies it's like it's like the same thing with like surfing right there's like three steps to it you know you like you get on the board paddle, stand you up, paddle turn. you stand up and then yeah you ride the wave and it's like but there's like a thousands of intricacies that you can do when you're on the board and you can walk forward or walk back or carve this way or that way and it's like yeah but unless someone who does have a deeper understanding it like that person needs to be able to explain it in a way that's super clear and simple so that so that they can just see it as like three steps and not get overwhelmed by all this this depth to it and then be able to be excited about the depth of going into the more intricate details. Well, yeah. And the, and the, the learning too, like the, I, I don't necessarily like, like there's so much feeling in surfing that you actually have to get on the wave and you actually have to feel something happen to you, which is where the wave actually picks, picks mm-hmm. you up and starts carrying you. And it's a feeling that all of a sudden you feel it and you're like, you know, you're on the wave, like, you know, you got it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel that, like, then you'll stand up too early and like, but once you feel that feeling and you feel it, then it becomes intuitive. And it's the same with this teaching. Like I, but I, but I can, it's funny. I can like teach you about it, but you got to have the feeling for yourself and you can understand it all day. Mm -hmm. But but if you haven't experienced it, then my teaching is like, you got to do it, I guess. Learn by doing. Yeah, I like that rule. <laughs> Makahana ka ike. Makahana ka ike. Yeah, so we, we did that today. We made a plant juice from bananas and comfrey. Oh, nice. Comfrey, yeah. And then from the bananas, I taught them how to go to vinegar or to go to a tincture. Or to go to a tincture, yeah. Yeah. So once you're done fermenting, either turning, like, aerobically fermenting that or using alcohol to pull out other properties. Mm-hmm. So. I haven't really seen any banana tinctures at the store. No, I know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the properties of it would be. I mean, it'd be I, cool to dose people on banana. Do people have the ability to, like, test that stuff? Like, in a lab or... Like so this, this is this is this is a miracle of natural farming that I think hasn't been unlocked yet. Is like as as the the process is simple, right? Four steps to it. But then as we start to analyze and like fill our brains with facts and our computers with bits and like bring order to this chaos, I think we'll find out that like, oh yeah, that chaos was just awesome the way it was and it was good. We didn't maybe need to order it. We just needed to like vibrate with it in a way that resonated, which in itself is a sort of order. Mm -hmm. So you get right to the S shape of the yin yang. (laughs) Can you repeat what you just said? Maybe, but definitely in different, in a different way. Uh But yeah, I I think like, uh, maybe think about too much what i'm saying but like the the merging between order and chaos Mm -hmm. and that sometimes they overlay each other so if i want to find because if i want to find order in something i have to overlay order onto it and uh It's, it's like the difference between like music and noise like noise is just like ordered or music is just like ordered static noise. Yeah. And noise focused is, and concentrated yeah. and, and have consciousness thought about it. So you, to the chaos, you brought order, mm-hmm. but then it all depends on your level of integration. Like what level of the system are you at to determine whether this fragment that I have is ordered or is chaotic? What fragment do you have? Yeah, so say I have I have a computer sitting on this desk. Is that order or chaos? 
it's a lot of I feel like a lot of orders in like the manufacturing and the building of it, but it's like pretty chaotic, uh, perceived chaotic on like the, the internet. Well, and what I'm what I and the other that that's true within it. And what what I was saying about the order and chaos is if I look at it at this level of seeing it right here, it looks pretty ordered to me. Mm -hmm. But if I zoom in a whole lot, it may look more chaotic. Or if I zoom out a whole lot, it may look more chaotic. Mm. It's only ordered because I'm at this level. Of focus. Yeah. So there's that aspect on it too, where where even something that seems very ordered may be actually part of this chaos spectrum and different ways of looking at it. Or something could be perceived chaotic at at this focal point, and then zoomed out, it could look orderly. It's kind of like the the spirals or the the patterns of like creation when you look at like earth on like micro fractals to like zoomed out of like space fractals of galaxies and stuff it's kind of like but that's what you the pattern is the key there the pattern is what enables you to see it and then recognize it and recognize it in many places even though it's chaotic the pattern yeah i think uh, yeah coming coming back like pattern pa pa the pa turn pa turn pat tur tur earn pa turn pa turn pa turn yeah it's a pa pattern it's a pat you know that you that you see and that's that's what brings order to like chaos which would be like the field that it's in you see a pattern and you're like oh well that's a unit i recognize that that's ordered that's there that's something and then the rest is kind of nothing until it forms into that mm. and as you zoom in and out or you interact with the systems different things become recognizable and or not hmm. so what i'm trying to do is give people a pattern to turn plants into some of the best medicine because there's all this this chaos around us in this this land that we live in all these things that we don't we don't know about but if you follow this pattern which is to take plant material and to ferment it this way through these four steps mm -hmm. that comes out that order that you've created out of this chaos is then like super medicinal and helps so that's that's what I'm trying that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, is uh look at all the invasive species as like potent medicines that can be fermented into medicinal solutions for plants and humans. And yeah. It's like yeah, and like instead of dozing the jungle, it's like why don't you just ferment the things that are going off in the jungle and then apply that onto your crops that you're trying to grow and then see observe what happens yeah 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 it will assist nature with what it's trying to do mm -hmm. the plants are trying to do something like and this looking what what are they trying to do they're, they're trying to grow I think I think they're interacting with the the secret society with the microbes. Yeah, and then if you looked at the plant, like microbes were on Earth before plants. Like pl the plants we know are actually like fairly recent. Mm. All this, all that life you see out there, like there were microbes since way before those plants came about. So I think when we when we look at the plant, we think, oh, like the plant is growing. Like, why is my plant dying? But I think if you understand the secret society, the ultimate role of the plant, it's actually like a microbial solar farm. You know, you know, like, like microbes were living on earth and then all of a sudden one of those microbes got this idea, like this consciousness 
pattern emerge. They, they, they convince plants to power their civilizations. Well, well, no, like like what a plant, a plant, a plant is like a is a micro super aggregate, like that. That so, like a microbe formed into a bigger plant cell. You know, like it just. It, it, like like a one like because I think I think the way it started was kind of like there's there's fungus and then there's algaes mm -hmm. and then they kind of merged together and made lichens and then lichens kind of then you emerged into like other types of plants like from ferns and all the, all these different types of things but initially it was a partnership between a microbe that could dissolve rock which is the fungus and a microbe that could turn solar energy like the infrared, whatever bandwidth they're using from the sun into metabolic energy that they could take, you know, just infrared en or, or, or electromagnetic energy and turn that into movement. Like nourishment for their, for the microbes movement and growth. Ability to find food and reproduce. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so, so they partnered and then they, and then they made pl plants. Like after after a long ass time, they're they're like, but but once once they figured it out, like once those microbes discovered that pattern, mm -hmm. then they're like, bro, this is awesome, and then it just that pattern just started self replicating, because they were they were like you know tuned into it. So yeah, b being able to observe nature and see what patterns are out there, and w which patterns do we want to replicate, and which ones do we want to preserve, and which ones do we want to maybe let go, and like. Yeah, reapply with different patterns. Yes, I mean it's good metaphorically to bring into our own consciousness on that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm feeling like I want to start growing mushrooms more intentionally. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's like they're it's like they're able to grow as like a byproduct of the natural farming, but I feel like I'm not doing them any. Yeah, yeah. I want to be able to know them and like understand like which ones they are. And it's like yesterday out, out here where the turmeric and stuff is growing on the table is like mushrooms are, are growing right on the table. And I, I took a picture and I put it on Instagram yesterday and I, I've done it before too, but it's, it's, they're just growing right on like plywood or something like rotting plywood. That's just on a table. And they're able to just like regenerate and grow. And it's like, that's just like a byproduct of watering the plants, like in the nursery. Like what happens if I get a little bit more intentional and start to like learn about, you know, more nour nourishing environments for mushrooms to grow on. And then the effects of like that. Cause it seems like by learning about fungi, we can, you can like definitely have like a, a huge effect on uh, not just your personal family, but like your local community and everything like around you just by diving deeper into the, that's what it is, I guess, diving deeper into the secret society of mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's in, in immense untapped potential in the, in the secret society realm that only a few of the mushrooms or, or of the fungus make mushrooms yeah and have like fruiting small, bodies like a small percentage of yeah of the microbes or... but imagine if there's another microbe like how they talked about getting mana in the desert mana in the mm -hmm. desert imagine if it was some mushroom that somehow some biostimulant that you applied gave it enough energy that it could put out a fruiting body that it could be like an, another perfect food for us as humans. You, you know, we can, we can eat much, a lot of different mushrooms and they're in like so, certain mushrooms like, like uh, chaga and reishi, I, I'm told are really medicinal mm -hmm. and have these curative powers. What if there's a soil microbe that hasn't fruited yet that, that us as humanity, we don't know yet. Like we think portobello mushrooms are awesome, but what about like, you know, this other mushroom, the, the David Icasis, that is like super delicious and way bigger. That'd be great. I think like, yeah, I'd love to be able to grow more mushrooms and 
just need to do more research and more put more energy into it and and participation but it seems like you can grow like a lot of food and like medicines and stuff pretty simply and it's yeah it seems like you can get genetics Mm -hmm. online pretty easily too as long as you're doing it for scientific purposes um they'll send even like psychedelic mushrooms they'll send spores to hawaii as long as it's for scientific research well i know i know if if you're if those mushrooms are already found here if they're already here then you can send more spores no problem usually that's that's how it works so if the mushrooms here which almost every mushroom is already then yeah ordering the spawn and and then it's just like i i guess i just need to do it i've done it through like natural farming but it it's like i know friends that they just take like a little spore or they take like a little piece of the cap of the mushroom and then they put it in like some sort of food that's like hard cooked like like rice just like brand or rice or whatever just like, yeah. and then they put it in the middle and then they they put a breathable lid on it in a jar and then let it sit for a few days and then it, it's like a big white balloon just like i am and, and then they and then they take like a piece of that balloon and they put it into another substrate like depending on what the mushroom prefers like wood chips or cardboard or whatever and then it starts to bloom on the thing and then you have fruiting bodies from just like a little piece of a spore or whatever yeah but i <laughs> so uh, yeah the the process you're talking about it is almost like just like the natural farming process you're basically getting a seed imo and once that thing blooms you're picking like the spot that you want you know like because you can see different colors happen on your rice Mm -hmm. you pick the spot you want and then you put it on more rice and so you're inoculating with that one onto another like from one colony onto a new substrate and then it grows out and now you've like isolated a colony it's the same research and technology that these multi-million dollar labs and biotechnology people are doing they then t- are able to t- grow those things out and then run them through DNA spectrum analyzers really fast and categorize these things and then try to, you know, patent them so that they can make money off of them. Hmm. But this same technology you're talking about is that simple and should be open source and everyone should know about this. How do you get the secret society? How do you isolate it? How do you grow it out? And and the only the only other thing that I that about mycology that sometimes I I think about is people say like that that's a good way to bioremediate the earth but the only difference is that the substrate that you have to use to grow the mushrooms to get like a an oyster mushroom for say is I have to put it into like a bunch of sterilized hay or sterilized wood chips or oil yeah but but those but the the you have usually in mycology you have to have a sterilized yeah, substrate super clean and that that part is the only difference that i think that makes imo as a viable solution for remediation is that you don't have to be so like clean in it in it that when you grow diversity those same mushrooms will bloom mm-hmm. and it, get them enough biostimulants and they'll bloom but they may not necessarily put out these fruiting bodies because their power is in diversity, which is what you, what you're talking about. This mycology growing mushrooms yourself is like getting one isolate, one strain, and then putting only that guy and giving only that guy food. Mm-hmm. And then that's the only one that will bloom or fruit. Yeah. But but essentially, you're talking like where you're talking like that's that's where natural farming and just mycology diverge is right at that point of one one you're going and we're just saying we're just going to put them all out there we're going to feed them all and the best they're going to win yeah and the other is saying i want just this one because i know that there's like three types of fungi i think there's four major classes four but like one is that i can think of is like um saprophytic uh-huh. which is like the decomposer yeah but it but it doesn't have a symbiotic relationship with the plant 
It's just like it has a symbiotic relationship with the microbes around it because it's it's waste product then becomes their food, but it doesn't have a direct relationship where it's exchanged the microbes with that mushroom are exchanging with the microbes at the root zone of the plant. And then there's like the symbiotic fungi, which is like the mycorrhizae. And that's kind of what the, I mean, the seed or the IMO2 is, is like a diverse collection of, of this mycorrhizae network that is able to exchange information and nutrients and food back and forth between the plants and the microbes and the soil. And then there's parasitic, which is where it's just not a, yeah, it's not a mutually um, beneficial relationship between the the host and the plant or whatever, the microbes in the plant. So, yeah, there might be a fourth one. I don't know. But what about the neutral microbes? I guess yeah, the neutral <laughs> microbes. But this is fungi. Team neutral. Know. Team neutral. But yeah, so um, being able to. Uh, well, the, the mushrooms that you're going to eat are probably like in the saprophytic family. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But, but I've seen what oh, I guess where I was going with that was I know people that will culture like saprophytic mushrooms and then they'll apply them on like wood chips and then they'll start fruiting and they'll decompose the wood chips. But I don't necessarily think that's as effective as like a good seed IMO where you're still going to get those fruiting bodies, but you're going to create this mycorrhizae like network. Whereas the saprophytics don't, they don't have that same relationship with the plants as like the, the mycorrhizae fungus do. There's like a difference like between the two, I guess. So you're, you're using the, the Korean natural farming methods you think are, are, how how does that differentiate? Because in, yeah, it's different because Korean natural farming is you're going to like a native forest, ideally old growth that has all this diversity and you're collecting like a snapshot of the collective diversity. Whereas if, and then, whereas if you were to apply that to your wood chips, I feel like it would then create a network of forest dwelling microbes Whereas in, instead, if you just found a, identified like a, a saprophytic mush, mushroom species in your nearby forest where you see a mushroom rotting on a log and then you, you, re, you take a piece of that culture and then grow it in a substrate and then reapply it to your wood chips, I feel like you'd get, you'd accomplish the goal of applying a a mushroom or a specific microbe that would break down the wood chips. But I feel like for the same amount of energy or less, you could just collect the super diverse collection. That's going to have like the saprophytics and the, the mycorrhizae. And, and the super diverse ones, like the Korean natural yeah. farming way of like going and getting a seed IMO. Yeah. I always, I always thought that too. I mean, just make seed IMO and then kind of liquefy it and just spread it around. And it's always, you're just getting that diversity put out there and put into the world. And it's always good to have more friends. And yeah, always good to have more friends. <laughs> increase the secret society membership. My, my symbiosis with it. Yeah. Inc yeah. Increase. Have have we had any new people sign up for tuning into the Secret Society podcast? Well, there's trillions of members. Uh, yeah, there's trillions of members. Yeah, so we're doing really well. On that. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, that's yeah, and the, the second hour is, it's only, we it's basically $2 a month. Or, you know, it's, no, excuse me, it's $2 an episode because it's $8 a month. And we do four episodes are coming out every month. So, um, and that's not including all the episodes that have already come out by the time you heard this or by the time you signed up for the, uh, that's true. If you wait longer, your $8 <laughs> is worth more because you can download all the previous episodes for just $8 a month. You get, you know, every, the most current and all the archives, so, archives, updates, revisions. Yeah. So if people want to join and then quit and join and quit so that they can save money, that's, that's fine too. We, we encourage that. 
<laughs> you encourage that? Yeah, because then I, in fact, one one of my inspirations was uh, this thing called the THC podcast. Uh huh. You ever you ever listen to it? Greg Carl Wynn and Company. That, that's that podcast is awesome. And basically, he does a two hour thing where first hour is like conspiracy theory, talking <laughs> all kinds of great stuff, and then the second hour you got to pay for. And the reason I got turned on to it was he interviewed Eric Dollard, who's one of the people that I follow because he's all into electricity and like this deep biological pattern. Like he invented a whole new algebra, versor algebra, which explains waveforms and the I Ching and, you know, how the universe works. Mm -hmm. And he did the second hour with this guy, with Eric Dollard and Greg Carlwood. And so I was like, shoot, I'll check out the second hour. And I ended up subscribing. And then I turned out to get a lot of value from it. And every once in a while, I'll stop my subscription because I'm like, I don't want to pay for it for a while. And then I'll I let them accumulate and then I'll resubscribe for eight bucks. And then maybe I'll forget for a month or two and I'll pay them like 30 bucks or so for like all this super good information. And then I just put it on my podcast thing, put it in my pocket, and I'm listening to some of the best podcasts. And so, so that's why it's it's worth it's worth the eight the eight dollars or two dollars an episode for the, for this because, or if you archive them and wait, then. But anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to share my inspiration for this and this thing because, he, he it's also another good podcast to yeah partner up with him yeah partner up we yeah we could we have the ability to potentially interview other podcasts or other people or. Well, it seems, it seems like that's what people do to kind of gain popularity is like you kind of, you know, schmooze with each other. Like an, an artist features someone on an album and then all of a sudden people are like, oh, you know, this person and such. And so, you know. Yeah, it's like it's like everyone's in their own little microbial, has their own microbial secret society. And it's like by having a guest or multiple guests on you know, their microbial networks are being exposed to what, like what content we're sharing or creating if we're doing an episode together and then vice versa. So it's like opening up multiple streams of like network connections between, yeah, different, different people. (laughs) Well, like, like Logan was talking about last, last episode, he was talking about cracking the nut and the consciousness, the, the, what do you say? Holly Selassie. Holly Selassie being like the consciousness, the consciousness and the like undisputable heir to the throne of David or King, King David. And then that showing like the scientific and the historical connection between Holly Selassie and Christ. And then, yeah. Well, I just I just thought it was interesting that in the second hour we really we got deeper into it, we went into some farming things, we did a few things, and that's that's what I like about this format is that it enables us to go a little bit deeper. Yeah, in the in yeah. the second hour, um, which which we're getting close to. We got about a couple more minutes left of the free episode here, so we could we could go into another episode. But something that I really liked about Logan's that we didn't talk about on the podcast, but we got to experience was it's like. His worm, oh. his worm bin, and oh. his multiple worm bins. It was interesting because I, I kind of like described it to Mandy, and she was like, "But, but why do the why do the worms have to be in like a bathtub?" And then it was like, it made me think about how like, is there a way to utilize like Logan's system, but make it in the earth where the worms are free to cruise? Um, yes and no. You got to worry about the moisture. If the worms get drowned, there's too much moisture coming in. His was in a bathtub that was raised up. It was about hip height. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the tub, then he put rocks under it. And then he put weed mat kind of stuff like plastic, woven plastic on top of that. And then he put in his food scraps. Uh So he had really good drainage. And then under that, he was able to put his bucket to catch the worm juice at the spout, yeah, which is useful. But you know, if you did a pit method, you'd have to definitely put like a roof above and not just above it, but like wide enough here so that you prevent like puddles from flowing in. Uh huh. Um, 
I, I saw some really good systems in the Philippines where basically they just took hollow brick tile and lined the sides and did a similar thing. With like with bricks, they just did it up. Yeah. And it was kind of like just like a raised bed almost, but like with worms. Yeah. What I what I liked about his was that it was nice and cool. It was like under those bananas in the banana grove. So it was semi outdoor, but he had the plastic over it to keep it there and it was really in the shade. And then man, when he pulled up that mango pit and right. it was just like a fist of worms. Like solid worms. <laughs> That was the craziest, like, I mean, not the craziest thing I've seen because I've seen weird shit, but thanks, internet. But, <laughs> but that was, like, one of the weirdest things. Like, I, I, you know, I'd expect worms to be here and there, but they were just all, like, sucking it. Like, just, just like, literally with their faces buried in the mango, just, like, sucking that. Seeing the mango. Mango, yeah, just, like, there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh. And I also noticed he didn't feed it too much. He fed it just one little bit here and there, and then. It... So you don't think he's feeding it every day? Yeah, I think he feeds it like once a week. And then the other worm bin that he had is like, where he's just feeding the worms IMO four, and then also like different soil amendments or things that maybe he has like excess of that he's just feeding the worms. That was one of the craziest things to, too that I saw. I mean, not like and I'm, I use these expressions. I don't really mean them, but I mean I, that was like really inspiring and to see him apply the vermicompost to IMO four and storage at the same time. Because mm -hmm. one one of the things like if I'm storing my he's sto my he's storing his IMO is my it? activated IMO. It's 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 alive and it's kind of rotting and or it's not in the spot that it really wants to be yeah but his have worms crawling through it and he like dusts them with kelp and what what else he was he was feeding this thing like his imo activated i am like soil microbes and worms all living together in a truck bed right yeah, and like a trailer, like food the, taco. It looks like he put stuff. cardboard down at the bottom of it or something like like cardboard down at the, like an old truck bed with cardboard that kind of then he, I don't know, he wasn't really turning it. The worms were just crawling through. No, I, I think he just like, just it just probably grows and grows and grows and then he, har he utilizes it as, as like a liquid inoculant and... And then he also said that he like will sprinkle it on his potted plants and stuff when they're in the nursery. And... Did you see how dark the color was though? How rich it was? Yeah, it's really dark. Yeah. yeah. Like that was just like, when I, when I was looking at that, I was like, man, that's the way to store IMO. Cause he's not only storing it, he's like making it richer as he's storing it. Yeah. And it's like, it's like instead of it, like, preserving and rotting it's like it's activated but just so slightly and it's growing and, and evolving but yeah it's like living yeah man logan is one of the best um farmers i know one of the best the one of the best farmers that you know yeah And I think I think it's his spiritual attention to detail that he really goes he goes into. I think he's like he's like me. In terms of if he was more applied out, out on the farm more. Like if I if I if I literally spent like a full time job at my farm, th things would be growing amazingly and just and popping off. But I, but I feel I think similar to like to Logan. I don't, I don't know if I can really speak for him, but I feel like he he sees like a bigger mission. That's why he has like conscious rhythms. Mm -hmm. So like he he lives it, and he's a really good farmer. But his, you know, like he, if he put all his energy into farming, 
it would be unreal and the amount of produce he could make is unreal thank you for tuning in to the first free hour of the microbial secret society podcast hour two is for members only you can become a member at www.microbialsecret.org thank you and may all the beneficial microbes be with you